there's a fellow who uh, made a video and he criticizes our site, our notion of science, our notion of physics. And I'm going to be addressing each one of his points. And the point he made, uh, one of the points he made, and that I'm going to talk about today, is whether if you have a PhD, right, does that mean that you understand physics? And so let me put him on here. Give me a second. Okay, let me turn this fellow on. Here it goes. Listen carefully. The issue to be resolved in this rebuttal is, does having a PhD in mathematical physics imply that the individual understands physics? Well, if you have a PhD, you're far more likely to understand the subject that you have a PhD in than someone who doesn't have a PhD in that subject. If you've got a PhD, that at least shows that you have a decent understanding of the subject, because you do need a decent understanding of the subject to be able to get a PhD. Okay, so the question is whether you need a PhD to understand, or we can put it in different terms, we can say that a person who has a PhD, for example, in so-called mathematical physics, right, uh, whether he can understand things better than you or anyone else. And I take exactly the opposite view, okay, Here, here's my uh, rundown of that, okay, these are what I call the fallacies, okay. First of all, I think it's an easier for an eight-year-old to understand physics. Uh, than it is for anyone who's gone through high school or college. And you might say, well, that sounds counterintuitive. Uh, and let me tell you why. Because, see, when you get to high school, when you get to college, they start feeding your brain. Okay? And uh, when we come out of there, we come out and believe for example. Right? I'll give you a good example. Uh, we believe that electricity consists of the flow of electron beads from one atom to the next. That is what everybody thinks uh, electricity is. And so if you give someone a different version of that, you know, it's already hardwired in his brain, he's not going to change his way of thinking so easily. On the other hand, if you take a, a kid, you know, an eight-year-old kid, and you teach him the right way or you teach him a different way from the start, you know, he, he's got no reason to believe then that the, you know, electricity is the flow of beads. So that's, that's the key issue, okay? It's that uh, in, in high school, in college, they start forming our brains, and then it's very hard to get out of that. I know. I've been there, done that. Okay, so I call that the fallacy of authority, and that's what this is what it looks like. You have, uh, you could say, big brother there, or someone with a big degree teaching you, and you learn by rote, and then you repeat what this fellow told you. Uh, you believe it in great measure because if you want to make a career, you know, you do a career out of it. Uh, for example, physics. Well, you're not going to get an advisor unless, unless you know, you follow the rules, and the rules is you have to suck up. Okay, that's the issue. You know, and uh, I don't know how you can get a degree unless you uh, at least, uh, you know, uh, follow the party line. Okay? You have to be able to recite the catechism. That's what it amounts to. I call that the fallacy of authority. Anyways, uh, here you have some PhDs. This is what they believe. Here are some examples. Okay, they have proposed Big Bang, black hole, particle at two places at once, warp time. Now, how's that for, for uh, people who have degrees? what uh, PhDs, right? We're talking about the highest degree here. And if this is what they came out with, you know, I mean, what does it tell you about them? And this is what you got to think about. So the way I look at it, degree does not necessarily equal to understanding. In fact, I think it's the other way around. If you have a degree, typically it's because you've been brainwashed in a given direction, and it's very, very hard for you to, you know, come out of that. And uh, so, you know, just keep that in mind. When you go to college, they actually make you think in a given way. And, you know, it's, it's almost impossible for people to come out of that. Then there's the fallacy of democracy. What I call the uh, fallacy of democracy, this is what it looks like, okay? Uh, everybody voting for a theory. And that's also more or less what's happening at the college level. You know, you have all these mathematicians on planet Earth and they vote for a given theory, and so people say, well, it's been proven because all these mathematicians believe in that theory. Okay, and so you have, uh, you know, theory. Someone says, you know, part of them be at two places at once, and if everybody votes for that uh, because they've studied quantum mechanics, and you say, well, you know, that sounds uh, counterintuitive, that doesn't sound very rational, well, they're going to say that what you have to do is take a course in college so that you're brainwashed in the same direction. So, yeah, you've got that situation as well. And then uh, the last one is what I call the fallacy of tradition, okay? And this is what it, that looks like, okay? Here it is. That's the fallacy of tradition. You know, you, you, you believe in stuff because that's the way we've always done it. 
and a prime example are definitions. <clears throat> what people do with definitions is they, they, you'll see them here on comments that people make. And they go in there and they say, look, uh, this is the etymology of the word. I don't care what the etymology of the word, word is, because those words were created a long time ago. Maybe they come from the Latin, from the Greek, from the Persian, who knows from where. And they had a certain definition centuries ago. We've changed many of those definitions throughout time. You know, we've made, uh, we've given new definitions to old words. That's happened. But all those definitions are really in the realm of ordinary speech. When you bring them into science, hopefully, hopefully, you restrict their usage so that, you know, they don't cover everything out there so that you can't tell the difference between A and B. No, you have to make sure that you have a very crisp definition that you can use consistently. That's called rational, you know, scientific. And uh, so, yeah, the fallacy of tradition primarily relates to um, definitions, but it also, the way we do things, one of the uh, fallacies of uh, tradition also involves, you know, the fact that um, we have this notion of the scientific method of science that we have inherited from the 17th century, and we're not very willing to change that. We think we're on the right track, and it turns out that not a single mathematician who follows the so-called scientific method of the 17th century can tell you anything about gravity. They cannot tell you anything about magnetism. They can't tell you what electricity is. They can't tell you how the atom behaves. They can't tell you what mediator we have for light. In other words, they can't tell you anything about the invisible, intangible uh, entities and mechanisms that Mother Nature and Father Universe use out there. But they've been following the scientific method now, what, for 400 years? So they're not willing to change that. And in fact, I had a case this week. I was interviewed on Thursday by a fellow from England. And uh, so I told him up front that I have a different notion of what science is. I have a different notion of what the scientific method is. And I told him up front that he would be shocked because I was going to delete from the scientific method. I was going to delete mathematics and I'm going to delete also experiments. Now, he seemed to agree. He kind of liked the fact that I just, uh, you know, took mathematics out. He didn't give me a reason, but he seemed to like that. But when we got to experiments, he had big troubles with that. Okay? He said, you know, you're, you're going to remove experiments? I said, yeah, we don't need them. Uh, we don't do experiments in science. We explain them. And so I, I really put him against the wall on a given issue, on a specific issue. And I said, <clears throat> you have, um, you know, gravity. You let go of the pen. I always do my little experiment here. Let go of the pen, and it falls to the floor. Okay? You can't see or touch anything below or above the pen. Correct? And so the question is, what experiment are you going to use, meaning see, touch, right, eyes, hands, what experiment are you going to run to uh, elucidate the, uh, first, the, uh, the entity that mediates gravity, and second, be able to explain it because you proposed a, an entity that we can see or touch. So there, there is no way, there's no experiment you can run to detect the invisible intangible. The only way is to use the mind. You visualize and you try to imagine how Mother Nature, Father Universe, Devil, the God, whoever you believe in, how they could be doing this magic trick. Okay? There is no experiment you can run in the lab to detect whatever is causing gravity. And that's just one example. And so, you know, I, I, I told this fellow this. And again, here we have the fallacy of, uh, all these fallacies come back, uh, the tradition, uh, democracy, and specifically, you know, the, the, uh, one, uh, the uh, one of authority. People believe in authority. This is what they've been drilled with uh, in high school and college. And this is what they regurgitate, you know, as, uh, again, the party line. That's all it is. That's what it comes down to. And so uh, this fellow, he had troubles with that. And what was interesting that... Um, uh, we debated a little bit about some of the definitions, okay? And these are some of the definitions that I found in his site afterwards. I checked his site, and these are some of the definitions he's got out there. And the, the two that we're missing are the two most important ones, meaning he wasn't even on track on figuring out what are the most important definitions that we need, at least for the purposes of physics. And here, let me show you what definitions he proposed. What I want you to notice is that he mentions these words, specifically the word exist, but he never defines it. <laughs> but uh, so when I tried to define exist, he had a problem with that because it was contrary to what he believed in. Uh, he apparently was an atheist and he had a problem with me saying that, uh, you know, an atheist uh, was not a rational individual because an, an atheist talks about the non-belief of God or that he doesn't believe that God exists. 
And then I told him it was an irrational statement. It's an irrational statement because he doesn't understand what the word exist means. And physics is the science of existence. So that's how it all works. So here are his definitions. Okay? He says, believe to accept something as true. So he uses words such as true, false. You'll find it in there. I underlined some of these. What is knowledge? Fact. Truth. Okay? He talks about reality. What is reality? Well, you look it up there, that right at the bottom, reality is, means uh, reality is that which exists. Well, unfortunately, reality is a synonym of exists. So he hasn't defined the word reality. What he's done is he put a synonym, and, uh, and he goes around in circles because, again, he hasn't defined what exists means. So uh, this is the issue. And one of the issues that uh, was interesting about his definitions in that is that he uh, referenced Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand, as some call her, I call her Ayn Rand. Okay? And when he mentioned there are two that are really unimportant, they're not important as, uh, for example, entity and exist, but he put in there concept. Okay? He said a concept is a mental integration of two or more units possessing the same distinguishing characteristics with their particular measurements omitted. They are isolated by a process of abstraction and united by a specific definition. Uh, Ayn Rand was very verbose, and uh, she made nonsense of the word concept. The other one is reason. <laughs> and the problem is that reason, uh, she defined it, is the faculty that identifies and integrates the material provided by man's senses. Thinking is the process, logic is the method. So uh, Ayn Rand thought that senses had something to do with reason, whether you're sensible, right? whether you're sound, whether your argument is sound. And when you look up all these words, uh, you know, they're all um, uh, synonyms. Sound, sensible, reason, rational. They're, they're all uh, synonyms. So she never defined the word because she used synonyms to define them. Okay? You can't do that in science. science you, uh, synonyms are outlawed because a synonym is um, a circular definition, or what I call no definition at all. Okay? And uh, this is another one that he had here, he, because he um, as well as suggested that there are things that we know. And I said, we know nothing because no means to believe. When someone knows, he believes. He believes for sure. He's convinced of whatever he believes in. That's called knowledge. His knowledge could be different than my knowledge. So he gave me an example and he said, well, we know, we know that water boils at 100 degrees. Okay. And so this is the example. He said water boils at 100 degrees. And there's a couple problems there. The first one is that I'm going to take the I'm going to play devil's advocate, okay? And I'm going to say uh, no, water does not boil at 100 degrees. And he said no, hold, 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 let me prove it to you. Let me show you. Look, we, we put some water here. I heat it to 100 degrees and boil. And I say I don't believe you. I don't believe. I don't know your knowledge. I, I disbelieve you. And he goes in and no, but listen, let me show you. Let me prove it to you. Here's the truth. Here's the fact. And I continue to say no, 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 and no. What's he going to do? Kill me? I mean, there are people who simply will not change their minds, no matter what experiment, what proof you present, and they will continue to believe otherwise. And he didn't understand that. Knowledge is what one person has. Okay? And so the, that's one issue. The other issue is that water boils at 100 degrees. That's not an explanation. That's a description. That's a prediction. He can say, look, I did it 100 times. Now I can predict to you, and I can run an experiment where I prove to you that water boils at 100 degrees. So far, he hasn't explained anything. All he's done is describe what's going to happen. He hasn't told me why, what causes water to boil at 100 degrees. So I gave him a, a truth, a fact, a proof, right? The whole works. Um, a, a, you know, something that's been uh, confirmed by experiment. I said, look, NASA ran Gravity Probe B, what was that? I think 1971, okay? I think it was 71, 72, thereabouts. Anyways, NASA ran this experiment. And what was the conclusion? What was the physical interpretation for what they say is a comp another, yet another confirmation of Einstein's theory, okay? What was the explanation? They said that the Earth drags, uh, drags time around itself. It's known as frame dragging, okay? And they've got a little title for it because they're saying that with respect to a given uh, frame, frame of reference, right, uh, something changes. They had these two gyroscopes that changed their position out there, and they said, oh, we confirmed it, and we proved it, et cetera, et cetera. And so I gave them that explanation. I said, look, uh, NASA says that Earth, as it spins, it drags time around itself, which makes no sense whatsoever from a physical point of view, okay? Mathematically, we don't care. We're saying that ma the explanation they gave us is, is nonsense. And he says, well, I don't believe that. I said, what do you mean you don't believe it? It's knowledge. We've proven it through an experiment, like you said. 
And he said, no, that knowledge, I don't believe. I don't believe NASA. <laughs> so, so, I mean, again, knowledge is what one person believes, okay? The, his neighbor doesn't believe it, okay? And he said, but my knowledge is justified. You know, that comes from Plato, justified true belief, okay? And he said, but my, what if it's justified? What if I have a justification for having that knowledge? Okay? And I said, justified means belief. What is justified? Who justified it? The Pope? The Dalai Lama? I mean, who justified it? Justified means opinion, belief. So all he said is he believes his belief. That's all he said when he says that his knowledge is justified. So no, those people who insist that knowledge is different than belief, well, I want a definition. Don't tell me that you, knowledge is different. Just tell me what each one exactly means, and I'll be glad to tear it apart. Because to this day, we equate, well, we st we're still using Plato's definition. And that one uh, it comes out as justified true belief. That's what knowledge is. And all they're saying is that your belief is justified. But what is justified to one human being is unjustified to another. And knowledge comes down to being equal, exactly equal to belief. There's no difference. Okay, Experiment will not change that, okay? No experiment will change that. Okay, so so um, what was this uh, fellow's uh, beef? Well, the problem was when I said that atheists are as irrational as agnostics and as deists or the, uh, theists. Why, why are these three groups uh, irrational? They're irrational because they never define the word exist. So they argue in circles. One guy says, I believe that God exists. And he presents all his proof. The other guy says, I don't believe that God exists, and he presents all his arguments and proofs. And the agnostic says, well, I don't know if God believes or uh, exists or not. Uh, I don't know what tests we can run. I'm not sure what arguments they have beyond that. You know, they have like several arguments. But essentially, it's a guy who hasn't made up his mind. He's on the fence. And I'm saying all these three individuals are irrational. Why are they irrational? Well, for that, we, we go back to Mrs. Ayn Rand, okay? Maybe she can clarify for us why it's irrational. Here's Ayn Rand's... Uh, Definition of entity first, okay? Thing, what is a, what is an object? What is a thing? What is an entity? She liked the word entity, no problem. We considered it a synonym, okay? No, of object and of uh, thing. So where's the problem? Let's, let, let's look at her definition. We'll find out. Here it is. Okay, she says entity, okay? And she says to exist is to be something. And we have a problem there. As you can see, uh, uh, she essentially uh, was a, a pupil, uh, a follower, whether she knew it or not, of David Hume and Immanuel Kant, who said exactly the same thing in the 18th century, because they couldn't tell the difference between exist and a thing, or uh, exist and an object. So she says, to exist is to be something. Absolutely not, but let's continue. As distinguished from the nothing of non-existence, it, it is to be an entity of a specific nature made of specific attributes. And this is where it goes wrong. Uh, I want you to listen to this because she essentially uh, synthesizes what most people out there think a thing is. Okay, The development of human cognition starts with the ability to, what? Perceive things. In other words, entities. Perceive. It's that perception word that introduces the observer uh, where we don't need them. And so she continues, says, of man's five cognitive senses, only two provide him with a direct awareness of entities, sight and touch. Exactly the ones that we kill. We say sight and touch have nothing to do with physics. Okay, we don't use sight and touch when we theorize. We have to kill the observer. We do it mafia style. Rub the witness out. That's the way it works in science. In order to perceive this something, he needs sight and or touch. Okay, so she's going to emphasize the observer. She's going to emphasize the witness. She says we need sight and we need hands, uh, touch. We need eyes and hands. It is by perceiving entities that man perceives the universe. Okay, so she did emphasize uh, that for entities, for things, what you need is eyes and touch. And what is eyes and touch? It's also exist. Because exist is defined exactly in the same way, not only by Ayn Rand, but David Hume and Immanuel Kant. Okay, and so we move to existence, which is what concerns us, because we're going to be talking about the atheists who say that they don't believe in God. We are looking at the deists and theists who say they do believe in God, and the agnostics who say that they don't know whether to believe or not. And this is what Ayn Rand had said about existence. Existence exists. <laughs> existence exists. Now, how's that for a definition? And the act of grasping that statement implies two corollary axioms. That something exists, which one, what, perceives and that one exists possessing consciousness. Consciousness being the faculty of what? Perceiving that which exists. All she did was chase her tail around. If nothing exists, there can be no consciousness. Uh -huh. A consciousness with nothing to be conscious of is a contradiction in terms. Okay. If that which you claim to perceive does not exist, 
What you possess is not consciousness. <laughs> Whatever the degree of your knowledge, these two, existence and consciousness, are axioms you cannot escape. Whether you know the shape of a pebble or the structure of the solar system, the axioms remain the same, that it exists and that you know it. Again, knowledge introduced together with existence and things. So she continues, she says, to exist is to be something, absolutely not, as distinguished from the nothing, nothing of ex non-existence. The greatest of philosophers, she was referring to Aristotle, has stated the formula defining the concept of existence and the rule of all knowledge. A is A. <laughs> a thing is itself. Existence is identity. Now, uh, all she said was nonsense. Okay? Uh, a is A, we talked about that the other day, is absolute nonsense. The uh, identity, the law of identity, and then the, you have the law of non-identity, which is A not equal B. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's all nonsense. No, what we do in science, we have to define what an object is, and we have to define what existence is. Once we define those words, we can start doing physics. Okay, and so some people confuse me with Ayn Rand, and those that do simply have not figured out how different my stuff is from what Ayn uh, pr uh, proposed. Uh, an object is that which has shape. Existence is physical presence. Physical means object, presence means location. An object that has location exists by definition, and as you can see, there's no uh, provision in that definition. Nothing, there's nothing in the specification of that definition that requires belief or an observer. If something has, is a, if you have an object, that which has shape, and it has location, it exists by definition. If God wants to exist, first he's got to be an object, got to be a thing, and then that's not sufficient either. He's better have location. There had better be distance between God's chest and mine. There should be a straight line of direction between God and me, no matter where, no matter what dimension God wishes to hide in, okay? So let's go with the conclusions here for this fellow, okay? Uh, conclusions, high school, college education, what is that? It's known as brainwashing. What they're gonna be doing is you're gonna be learning by rote. You read a book, maybe you even run an experiment in the lab, it doesn't matter, but they're gonna coach you on what to believe, okay? And um, th what's the problem? The problem is that all that's accompanied by irrational explanations. And they don't care about mechanisms. They haven't figured out any of the invisible intangible mechanisms. They dismiss that as philosophy, as opinion. And I can summarize it by saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. No, it's easier for an eight-year-old to understand, uh, for example, what I'm proposing, okay? because he, his mind has not been polluted. So a little boy might be more uh, uh, predisposed to understand a new theory than an old dog, you know? who's gone to high school and, uh, and college, especially a PhD, who has to get an advisor for his thesis, that guy is not going to change. So I see it the other way around in uh, this uh, British fellow. I'm saying that um, if you've got a PhD, oh man, you, you've gone through the whole machinery. <laughs> They've been conditioning you for quite a while. you know. So if I go in there and say, look, I'm going to erase the uh, scientific method that you inherited from the 17th century, He's not even going to listen to me. 